And if you have your Bibles open at Matthew 24, just keep them open there. And uh, we'll be going to some scriptures uh, in a moment. Billy Graham, the globalist evangelist who died last year, says in his autobiography, a large volume it is indeed, Just As I Am, is the title of it. He says in that autobiography one day while he was traveling with President J.F.K. Kennedy, He was near the president's residence. Kennedy was driving and he stopped the car and turned to Billy Graham and said, do you believe in the second coming of our Lord Jesus? Graham said to him, I most certainly do. And JFK said to Billy Graham, does my church believe that? And being diplomatic, Graham said to him, well, they have it in the creed. And JFK said to him, they don't preach it, nor do they tell us about it. Would you tell me something about it? And he did. And he briefly outlined to the President of the United States of America the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to this earth. And after he was finished, he said, I want to speak to you again sometime on this matter. And we all know that not long after that, indeed, we all know that in Dallas, Texas, he was assassinated. I want to say to you that the Roman Catholic Church is not the only church that doesn't preach it. Many of the mainstream Protestant churches don't preach it. In fact, most of them. And many of the evangelical churches in Ulster don't preach it now. They used to. I met a man some years ago, and he was 10 years in an evangelical church, and he said, I never once heard of our Lord Jesus coming back again. Well, can I say to you tonight that the Lord Jesus Christ himself, 21 times during his three and a half years of earthly ministry, said that he was coming back again. It is in all the Gospels. And before the cross, just before the cross, He gave us these two great chapters of Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. 97 verses all to do with the return of the Lord. The Apostle Paul in 12 of his 14 epistles spoke on it. 300 times it's mentioned in the New Testament. Every New Testament writer mentions it. And in the last chapter of Revelation, Revelation 22, the last words that the risen Lord gave to mankind three times in that chapter, twice he says, behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. And then surely I come quickly. So my dear friends, be in no doubt tonight that the crucified, risen, ascended Lord to the glory is going to descend the slopes of the sky some of these days very soon and come in glory. This same Jesus, the angel says in Acts 1, this same Jesus whom you see go will come in like manner. The same man to the same mountain, to the Mount of Olives, will appear. Now, when is this going to be? No man knows the day or the hour or the minute or the moment because it's not past, it's past a day, it's past an hour, it's past a minute, it is to a moment, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. 
And there are many, many scriptures that tell us about his coming. They tell us about the speed of his coming, like the twinkling of an eye. That's beyond the wink of an eye, the twinkling of an eye. The scriptures tell us about the surprise of his coming. He will come as a thief in the night. The scriptures tell us about the suddenness of his coming. It will be like the lightning flashing from the east to the west. It tells us about the sound of his coming. It shall be the sound of a trumpet. Jesus said, be ye also ready, for ye know not the day or the hour that the Son of Man will appear. And the whole focus and main focus of these meetings, as far as I am concerned, is that you may be ready. And if you're in this meeting tonight and you're not saved, you're on very dangerous ground. Because I can tell you, you will have no time, no time, whatsoever, like the twinkling of an eye, and the church will be gone, and you will be left. Now, I say to you tonight, heed the words of the Lord. If you don't heed my words, be ye also ready. Many are the signs and many are the signals across the Word of God regarding our Lord Jesus coming again. And for the sake of those who are not so familiar with prophecy, let me give you some of them, and we'll be mentioning some of them as we go down through into our subject uh, in other evenings. There's the demonical sign. We never lived in a day in which there was such demonical activity. Now, we're not elaborating on those because they're not our subject. But I want you to think of the powers of darkness that's going on at the moment in our land and in our nation. And then there's the atomical sign, the nuclear sign, the rumors of wars is everywhere around us. And of course, I don't have to tell you about the electronical sign or the climatical signs or the spiritual signs or the political signs or the ecumenical signs, or the astronomical signs. That's only some of the signs that we are to be watching out for when our Lord Jesus Christ would be coming back again. Now, as I say, while we'll be touching on some of these, the main focus of our messages these Sunday nights will be the communal signs, the communal signs. Government and leaders all over the globe are all pushing for what they call a new world order. Every day you'll hear it mentioned in some form or another, the new world order. You listen for it. And it only simply means a global government. It means one leader, one head, governing all. Henry Kissinger, the Secretary of State in America, was one of the first men to coin that phrase, the New World Order. H.W. Bush kept at it all his presidency. Time and time again, Bush kept talking about the New World Order. Jimmy Carter, of course, he was one of the men that proffered this New World Order many times as well. The EEC... And I have a whole lot of other names for it, and I'll be given to you, and some of them are not nice. The EEC, the Pope of Rome, and the United Nations, they're all hell-bent on a united Europe, a united currency, a united market, a united banking system, a united church, a united judiciary. And I want to say to you, there's nothing new about it, nor is there anything orderly about it either. When you look at Brexit, there's not much order about it. And when we come, mainly we'll be not really into that to next week. There's nothing new about it. There's nothing orderly about it. The first man to try for a new world order was Nimrod in Genesis chapter 11. He was a wicked rebel, a wicked, wicked rebel. 
Uh, he hunted men. The hunter of men was his name. He hunted for the souls and to destroy the souls of men. He was a mighty hunter. And, and Nimrod said, let us build a city. Uh, and the tower that will reach up to heaven, one people. We'll have one language. We'll have one culture. We'll have one currency. And it was called Babel. Now, Be, Babel, E-L is God and Babe is gate. And what he was saying and what they were saying then, you read Genesis 11, we'll have a gateway to heaven. And they built this tower reaching up into heaven, and we'll, no, we don't need God. We'll be one language, we'll be one people, and everybody on the face of the earth will gather together, and we'll have one big community, just like they're still at today. And God came down, and he he threw the whole thing upside down, and he threw it into confusion. And that's why it was called Babel. It come, that's where we get the word Babel, and bab, babble from. He's Babel. You ever hear? She's Babylon. He's Babylon. And God cast the whole thing and destroyed it and brought it into confusion and scattered the whole lot of them. Now, I tell you, if you don't see Babylon going on these days in Europe, there's something wrong with you. God will destroy it too. And we will see that before the end of these meetings. Now let me again keep in mind those of you who are not that familiar with prophecy and before we go down into the beast and the Brexit in Britain. But I can tell you, my friend, it's, it's, it's very powerfully displayed in, in this book, especially in the book of Daniel. And we're going to see in the book of Daniel, we're going to see all that's going on at the moment. It started with a king 600 years before Christ came as a baby to Bethlehem. It started with a king who couldn't sleep. And it's still going on today. For Daniel chapter 2 has the beginning and the end of Brexit. And I pray that you will take heed to all that is going on. But before we go down into that, uh, I want to just uh, take you to some verses in Matthew 24, if you have your Bible open. You see, the, the, the disciples sitting on the Mount of Olives said to the Lord Jesus, what shall be the sign of the coming and what shall be the end of the age? And the Lord gives them in Matthew 24 a whole uh, plethora of uh, signs that would be happening before he would come. And the first one is in verse 4. If you look at verse 4, he says, Take heed that no man deceive you. Can I say to you four times in this chapter, verse 5, verse 11, and verse 24, and this verse here, I can tell you, he, he says four times he speaks about deception. And if you take the other Gospels that he mentions this in as well, in the same context, it's six times altogether. Now, he only mentions the earthquakes and the famines and the pestilences and the nuclear war and all those things. He only mentions them once. But our Lord Jesus Christ mentions deception four times, six times altogether. Can I say to you, we never lived in a day of such global deception as there is today. We never lived in an hour when so many people were deluded as they are today. And you know that yourself. People will believe almost anything today. They'll believe the lies of the devil. Remember, the devil's a liar. And it's him we're after in these meetings. He's a liar. Where does all this lie, deceit come from? Well, it comes from the devil. The whole world lieth in the lap of the wicked one. Revelation 12 says, Satan which deceiveth the whole world. I tell you, this massive global deception in every area of life. It is all around us tonight. And Jesus says, take heed. Now watch what he says. No man. No man. You see, the greatest deceiver of all after the devil will be the Antichrist, whom we will be unmasking in these meetings. The Antichrist. 
His, one of his many titles, maybe 15 or 16 titles for him in the Bible. One of them is the lie. He's the lie. There's a massive deception. He says, let no man. And my friend, listen, and get this into your mind and into your heart this, morning, this evening, and we must be faithful to the book. When he says no man, he's not only talking about the Jehovah Witnesses. He's not talking only about the Mormons or the Muslims or whoever else you would like or whatever else cult would come to your door. I tell you, my friend, he's talking, and we're talking about ministers in the church across this province, deceiving and damning people wholesale. Now, some of you mightn't like this preaching, but we must preach the word. They're saying to these young people, don't go to any of those gospel meetings. Don't have anything to do with this blood and thunder stuff. And one minister in an established church in Ulster not so long ago, he made the statement, and it's in the press, he made the statement. He says, there's no hell, and if there is, there's nobody in it. My friend, he's a liar. Do you know what he is? He's calling the Lord Jesus Christ a liar. Because the Lord Jesus Christ preached 14 times in hell, and the Lord Jesus tells us about a man who was in torments in hell in Luke chapter 16. But not only is he calling the Lord Jesus a liar, he's, he, 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 he's taking this old book and he's tearing it to shreds, and he's making a mockery of this old book. And God has revered this book above his name. And we can't listen to things like that. We can't listen to deceivers who tell us that this book is not truth. A friend, is truth. They say, live a good life. Pay your church bills. Go to church and pay your bills and do what you can and you'll go to heaven. I say to you in the authority of God's word, you will not. By grace are you saved through faith. Not of works. I was walking down the lane the other morning about a week or ten days ago. It was eight o'clock in the morning, and the other side of the gates on the roadside was a young man. And he had a car parked, and he'd got out, and he was smoking. Walking up and down the gate smoking. And I went over to him, I says, how you doing? He says, I stopped for a wee smoke. And well, I think he'd have been sorry he didn't drive on. He says, I've just stopped for a wee smoke. I said, I, that, a lovely man, lovely lad, and spoke to me, and I spoke to him. Young man, I said to him, son, if you were to die today, where would you go? He says, heaven, I think. And I says, what, what, would, what would be a reckoning that you'd go there? Well, he says, I've never done anybody any harm and, and have lived a right good life. And, and I says, son, you know, Jesus says, except a man be born again. Did you ever hear that before? He says, I heard it many times. And I says, son, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And uh, he looked at me. And I thought to myself, it'll not be the smoke and it'll take him to hell. We'll all get tied up with these things. And it'll not be the drink that'll take him to hell. And it'll not be the partying that will take him to hell. Do you know what will take him to hell and take you to hell tonight? Your sin. Your sin. Because we're born in sin and shaping and iniquity and nothing that defileth shall enter God's heaven. But not only do we see the deception of the people here, in verse 7 it says the distress. Jesus says, watch for the distress of nations. And in Luke 21, in the same context, he says, there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth. The distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. My friend, can you not hear this? Hear what Jesus said over 2,000 years ago? He says, come near my return. There'll be distress and there'll be perplexity of nations. That word perplexity means to be cornered. It means to be caged in. It means to be, have no way out. Distress, that's where the word stress comes from. Do you know what I read the other day or not so long ago? 
that 70 million people in Britain are on antidepressants. 70 million. It has rose 50% in the last 10 years. People are under fierce stress. And he says, the sign shall be men's hearts failing them because of fear, coronaries, pestilences, cancers. Do you believe that? Do you believe what Jesus says? Nations shall rise against nation. That is civil disturbance, is that nation within nation. Look at your world tonight. Look at France. Look at Greece. Look at Germany. Look at Venezuela, India. Look at Britain with Brexit. Rising nation, rising against nation. Look at Spain. Kingdom against kingdom and wars and rumors of wars. So Jesus says these are some of the signs. Watch out. Deception among the people. Distress in the nation. Disasters in the world. Look at verse 7. Famines pestilences, earthquakes in different places all at the one time, tornadoes, volcanoes, volcanoes eruption, hurricanes, fires, whole cities being burnt out, whole cities being barbecued, where fireballs are following cars at 50 miles an hour and barbecuing the whole family inside. And he said there shall be fearful sights. And we have got so climatized to these fearful sights. Nothing hardly surprises us anymore. Nothing disturbs us anymore. It's all here. And then depravity in the world in verse 12. Listen to what he says. And iniquity shall abound, and the love of many shall wax cold. Iniquity abound. Iniquity speeding up. Is that not so? Is that not so? In the last days, Paul says, perilous times will come. That word perilous is exceedingly fierce times will come. Iniquity abounding. Sodomy. Pornography. Transgenderism. Did you ever think in your life, and I'm a man of 73 years of age coming, and I've seen a lot and I've been around a lot, did you ever think in your life that there'd come a day in Northern Ireland when a mother would say to her child, what do you want to be today? Do you want to be a boy or do you want to be a girl? What clothes will I leave out for you today? Look at abortion. 198,000 people abortioned in 2017 in Britain. Nine million since the Act came in in 1967. Destroying the babies in the womb, the living, and now they want to pass legislation to destroy them at any age. The judgment of God is on Britain. And it's no wonder she is in confusion tonight. And you have seen nothing yet. The nation that God separated with the water to keep her clean, to keep the enemies out. It's a nation that has forgotten God. And judgment is coming upon it. Don't you think they'll get a nine million people from 1967? Hitler only gassed six million. These are the fearful times that we're living in. And will you hear this? And I say this with a, broken, with a burdened heart tonight. One million, now listen, mothers and fathers, listen to me. One million and a half of taxpayers' monies going to the LGBT, the sodomites. And do you know what a good part of that money is going to them for? That they, they would supply breast binders for girls unknown to their parents. They're paying out this money, the government, to this crowd. This crowd are getting these breast binders 
and the, encouraging the children to wear them, the girls at 12, 13 years of age, so that they'll eventually and soon be like a boy. Talk about child abuse. Our taxpayers' money. And if you want to get any more information than that, just get the February Evangelical Times. And they talk about child abuse. And they take an old plastic bag that's lying on the hedge in the barn. No more plastic bag. You're not allowed plastic bag. Why? They're killing the snails. But it's not the deception of the people that I'm after or the distress of the nations or the disaster on the earth or the depravity of the world. Here's what we are after in these meetings. A dictator in Europe. Look at verse 15. Now listen what Jesus says. Look at what he says in verse 15. Paul, in 2 Thessalonians makes the very same statement. Daniel in 9 and 27 makes this very same statement. Now listen to what Jesus says in verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. Can I tell you those are two names for the Antichrist? The abominator and the desolator. When ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. You know, some of these smart, modernistic scholars say that Daniel never existed. Well, our Lord Jesus Christ says he existed. And that's enough. He's quoting away from Daniel 9 and 27. And he says, when you see when you, when, 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 when you therefore shall see the abomination and desolator spoken of by Daniel, stand. So he's a man. Stand in the holy place. And whosoever readeth, let him understand. Read Daniel. Read Paul in 2 Thessalonians. Study this verse here. And you'll have no doubt that this is the beast of Brexit. And he has made his way through Europe to the holy place in Jerusalem. And you'll be hearing plenty about that. This is the man of sin. This is 666. This is the lawless one. This is the abominator and desolator who has deceived the Jews. And I tell you, he must have deceived them and you're going to see the great lie and the great deception or they wouldn't have had him or he wouldn't have been in offering sacrifices in the holy place. You see him standing in the Jewish temple and Paul in 2 Thessalonians says he's sitting in it. And we'll develop that in other nights. I will prove to you that this could happen within three and a half years from now. And that's halfway through the tribulation period. And I will prove to you, my dear friends, that this can't happen until the church goes, until every believer is raptured and snatched away and taken out, and then all hell is going to break loose. I will prove to you, without a doubt from the Word of God, that he has been three and a half years at this stage president of the European community. And I will show to you that he has solved all their problems. 
And I will be listening to you next listening to you next week. The call and the cry that's going on at this moment from different places. We need a man. We're looking for a man. Send us a man. Jacob Reese Mogg said the other day when they asked him if we don't get a deal by the 29th of March, what's going to happen? They said we'll be over probably to dictatorship. Send us a man, let him be a god or a devil. One boy says, we need a man. We can't sort it out. No, they can't. No, they won't. This is the Antichrist. I will prove to you that he's a devil incarnate, that he's the son of perdition, that he's the king of fierce countenance. And I will prove to you that he's the fifth world ruler. Glenn, could you put up a picture for us? You'll not be able to make the writing out and dim the lights as we come to a close. I promised the families that we'd have you out early with your children. There's a cup of tea afterwards. You're very welcome to stay. You'll not make the writing out. This is the image that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed 600 years before Christ's coming as a baby. And he went to bed and he couldn't sleep and he wakened and he slept. And this powerful image came before him. And he called in the Chaldeans and he called in all his men that were around him the soothsayers and all the great. He, he was a mighty king. He ruled the empires. The great Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold. Gold is superior, and then it comes on down to the silver, to the brass, and to the iron. And we will be dealing with that in nights to come. And he couldn't sleep and he sent for them and they couldn't do anything and he sent for Daniel, the young, godly Daniel. And Daniel related to him what this dream was and he told him, he says, thou art the head of gold. And he only reigned for so many years and then the Medes and Persians came and they toppled it. Every time they're toppled. Another enemy come in and toppled them. And then Alexander the Great, the Grecian Empire, came next. And he was tossed by Rome. And Rome led. And whenever we come down this mighty, this mighty picture here, uh, we see that each one is inferior as it comes down. And Rome is the legs of iron and the feet on the iron of clay. Now those historians who are here will know, and I'm not a historian, I left school when I was, when I was f- f- 14. But those historians will know, and those of you who read or learn in this will know that Rome never was defeated. Conquerors came and wiped out all the rest and took over world domination for a period. But Rome fell from within. Rome fell because of her debauchery, because of her, her, her friction, because of her, of her fights within one another. There was, what was there, six Roman empires down through the years. And remember, this Rome was in control when Jesus came. And I can I tell you that the ecclesiastical Rome will be swaying an awful sway when he comes back. But the Roman Empire was never defeated. And let me tell you something else that never reached Ireland. It never was defeated. It fell from within. But it's still alive tonight. The clay speaks about democracy. 
the iron, the iron rule, they were the iron-fisted military nation, Rome, they beat everything into subjection. And now what's going on now at this day, whenever you come to the feet and to the toes, all the rest of this is gone. But the toes and the feet, which are mingled with iron and clay, is the European economic community, as they call it, the common market, as they called it. And it's, it's still in action. And Rome the empire of Rome or the United States of Rome, of of Europe, is the whole Roman empire where they reigned. And the clay and the iron, democracy and theocracy, Daniel will show, and I'll show you next week where it says the iron and the clay cannot mix. Cannot mix. And we cannot, we cannot mix this land of Britain that God has so preserved time after time and battle after battle and how he preserved it from the very people now that are trying to rule it. The French and the Germans are the two big toes. And the toes are wiggling at the minute. And they can't find an answer to their situation. So they need a man. They need a man to come in and to sort the whole thing out for them. And rising out of this old Roman, they talk about reviving the Roman Empire, restoring the Roman Empire. That's what it's all about. Rising out of this Rome, old Roman Empire, rising out of this will come the Antichrist. And he will rule, and he'll deceive the whole jing bang of them, including Israel. But there's coming today, my friend, this is not the new world order. There's only one new world order, and there's a stone at the bottom of that, and we will show you where it tells us, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, he says, the stone cut out without hands, which speaks of Christ. Men had nothing to do with Christ, I'll tell you. He was born of the Virgin. He was the incarnate Son of God, the stone cut out without hands. Daniel told him, well, one day, Daniel's prophesying, he says, well, one day the stone will hit the feet and hit the feet and the toes and he'll destroy them and he'll put them into pulp and they'll blow away like the wind. And it's going to happen. Everything else that he prophesied happened. So we're living in the days of the very bottom part of this image of the toes and the feet of the iron and of the clay. And the next time you see and hear Toft or whatever you call them boys and over there, next time you see or hear them and you hear them debating in the House of Commons, just remember that this is the iron hand of Rome. Wanting her way again. And she'll use the Antichrist to do it. Can I say to you tonight, can I say to you tonight, Before next week, if you come back, read Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 9, Daniel 12, and Revelation 13. And when you're listening to your news, open your Bible. When you're you're listening to the national news or watching it, open your Bible. But when you're watching the local news, open your Bible too. Because this wee province, and I'm not political minded in any way, but this wee province 
has been the seedbed for gospel truth down through the years. And prayers that have gone up from these people and from this province are being heard from God in heaven. You mark my words. They've been heard from the God in heaven. He hears our prayers. He knows what's going on. They'd love to be rid of us. And if you don't see that, then watch it closely. They'd love to be rid of us in Ulster. In fact, they would relegate us to hell. Well, I can tell Mr. Tuff that he can go if he wants, but I'm not going. For I could take him down to near the border, to a square foot of ground one Monday morning, well, I looked up into the skies and I said, Lord, do something with this poor, wretched life of mine. And that day, that morning, he saved me by his grace. Oh, I tell you, I'm not going to hell. Are you going tonight? Oh, they'd love to be rid of us. But God is on our side. God will win the victory. And we're going to see and watch what's going to happen on the 29th and the days after it. It's all here in the Word of God. And when they talk about a new world order, turn them to the book and say, oh yes, there's a new world order coming. Our Lord Jesus Christ is coming back to stone and he's going to smash the whole business. And he's going to reign for a thousand years. He's the world ruler. And the only one. Every time some of them rose up. And there's a whole list of them. Hitler. Mussolini. Many others. Made a bid. Alexander the Great. Made a bid for world power. But let me tell you this. Do you know what a brother and man told me? And I'm finished. Do you know what a brother and man told me in Enniskill one time? He says, Bertie, the devil doesn't know when the Lord's coming. And he always had a man ready. And I began to think about that. He had, Mo- he had Mussolini. He had Hitler. He had Charmaine. He had Alexander the Great. He had Nebuchadnezzar. He had Darius the Mede. He had them all standing on the sidelines waiting to move in. God says, not time yet. They're not my men. Because he's in control. He's the sovereign God. This is him. You make sure that you understand this is him. The devil incarnate. And I'm glad I'll be gone. And I'm going to show you next Sunday evening that we're going to be taken out just in a moment in the twinkling of an eye before he's revealed. We'll not know who he is. Paul tells us three or four times until he's revealed. Revealed. Oh, he's there. Oh, he's about. Oh, he's over there. We could be watching him. We don't know. He has to be. But he's going to be revealed. But he's not going to be revealed until we go. How close are we not? To the Lord's return. Are you ready? Will you come to him tonight? Will you say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Come into my heart and save me from my sin. Say that in the seat. 
and he'll do it, you know. And then you'll be ready to go with him. May God bless you.